Alright, so today we'll be talking about the anatomy and physiology of the locus ceruleus. It is a small nucleus of neurons uh, that is uh, bilateral, bilateral and located in the brainstem, right here, uh, near the cerebellum and near the fourth ventricle right here uh, <clears throat> and near the pons. All right. And the nucleus contains about 20,000 to 50,000 neurons. Uh, the physiology, so let's start writing about physiology. Physiology, oh, sorry, it's a bit sloppy. Uh, <clears throat> primary, we could say arousal, and wakefulness, and also autonomic functions, but it also mediates in some higher order cognitive processes, such as attention, memory, perception, and motivation. So these will be higher order these will be the primary physiological functions. All right. Now, one of the most important things when looking at the physiology of the locus ceruleus that you'll hear about is that the uh, that this nucleus has two states. It has a uh, physic state and a tonic state. And this phasic state is elicited elicited by salient stimuli it has two to three bursts, I'll put quotations around it, bursts of action potential. Followed by a 200 to 300 millisecond cooldown. All right, and for the tonic state, this is primarily the arousal level uh, behavioral state. And it occupies a low frequency of two to three hertz. All right, and so this uh, tonic state will be a kind of general state that's going to be uh, active at any given time. And this physic state is a sort of special state that's going to list more uh, cognitive control uh, in terms of uh, attention and orientation within a scenario, given scenario. All right. So, for afferent and efferent connections, afferent and efferent connections, we have the dorsolateral and dorsomedial prefrontal cortex that are sending information in, the intersingular cortex 
the amygdala. the hypothalamus and nociceptive fibers spinal cord All right. so this is information coming in to the locus cerulius but uh, <clears throat> there's going to be two main uh, types of ascending fibers for the efferent connections. We'll have the uh, first, um, first, the dorsal tegmental bundle, dorsal tegmental bundle, so, which send to, let's just, down here, the uh, local brainstem structures, uh, forebrain, and spinal cord. And this is going to be the larger tract. Okay, the smaller one. is going to be the rostral paraventricular bundle. Okay. And this will go to uh, the diencephalon and to brainstem sensory areas. All right, as such. All right, and so this is pretty much it <coughs> for the afferent and efferent connections. The, uh, there are two uh, theories that should also be addressed when talking about the locus cerulius. One is an early law um, called the Yerkes Dodson Law, and it sort of works like this. It uh, shows the relationship between pressure and performance. So we got performance here, and this would be pressure, but in our case, uh, we could say the locus cerulius activity down here. And uh, the law works something like this, where this current state is uh, a state of inattentiveness. So inattentive. And this state at the far end is uh, distractible. So you can see if it's, if let's say if they're uh, grog groggy, right? Low uh, locus cerulius activity. They're at, at this current state, they're not gonna be able to focus their, their attention on any given task and be productive. Now, what if the activity is very high in the locus cerulius? Well, then they might get uh, disattentive because they're becoming so hyper um, excitable in a sense and easily distractible. Uh, so also, so both of these states make it difficult to be task oriented, right? And up here is basically where we have the sweet spot where um, a person is both engaged and task oriented. So it's an interesting uh, theory, which is sometimes applied to the locus cerulius, and it's good to know. Uh, there is also one more that should be looked at, and that is the 
uh, adaptive gain theory. So adaptive gain theory, let's write this down, is that you'll have a, <clears throat> you'll have the anterior cingulate cortex and, or the orbital frontal cortex, right? Creating an adaptation, adapting of what the uh, locus ceruleus mode is, is. So this is altering the phasic and tonic states, right? And this transforms into the gain expression. And this expression is going to be one of two things, whether, according to the theory, whether it's going to be exploration so this is for seeking reward, reward seeking behavior, and exploitation. Which would be, uh, I guess, consuming the reward behavior, actively partaking in it at the given time. And uh, I have a, uh, let me just bring up on the second monitor, I have a study that, that I was looking at, um, which talks about it uh, directly. The, they, they were, the researchers in this case were using the adaptive gain theory and applying it to the locus ceruleus, and they predicted that there would be an increase in baseline pupil diameter that would be associated with decreases in task utility and disengagement from the task. So this is going to be exploration. Whereas reduced baseline diameter, uh, but increase in, in task evoked dilations would be associated with task engagement or exploitation. And so their findings were consistent in showing that this pupillometry may be useful as both looking at the control state and looking at the locus ceruleus function. I'll be linking the, uh, a hyperlink to the uh, document. Uh, but yes, uh, thank you for listening and have a great day.